All right, folks, I'm here, and it says that we're live, and usually when we get to this point, everything is good, and there's no further problems. So uh, welcome to the show. I'm David Wilcock. Thanks for joining us. And this is about my journey to End Times LA to film the movie Levitation. Now, this has been uh, quite a week that I've just had. I really didn't want to be doing a video right now. I've had a crazy sore throat. Um, I only probably want to do an hour or less because, you know, the more I talk, the more it's going to hurt my voice. Um, but wow, I just wanted to kind of get on camera and talk to you a little bit about what's happened to Los Angeles. Wow. So for starters, hello, uh, before we get into all that kind of stuff, let's see if I can maybe amp up some color on this track here. This, oh yeah, look at that. See, I get some more, some more brightness. Very good. All right, so uh, we just got done with a very important project and that was something I've been delaying for, I don't know, a couple years and that is the actual filming of our movie Levitation. Now, what is Levitation? Well, uh, when I was going through years and years of television, I was working with Ancient Aliens, of course, and that's Prometheus Entertainment. The parent company is A&E. And there was a very specific rule, which was that I was not allowed to associate extraterrestrials and angels. Those two things, those two topics, were not allowed to be combined. And I was told specifically that if I mentioned angels, it would be cut from the show if it was in the context of extraterrestrials. Now, this is very interesting because there's a lot of really great information out there about the idea that there are definite connections between what we would think of as angels and what we would think of as, you know, extraterrestrials. And so like, well, what's the big deal, you guys? How come you don't want me to talk about this stuff? Isn't that kind of suspect? Well, you can speculate for yourself, and there's certainly a lot of evidence out there today showing that these guys running the media entertainment world are not necessarily so interested in promoting any types of traditional values, let's say. So I'm very, very excited about what we've done with this film. Um, I handed it off. It's directed by Michael Mazzola, and so... I created a treatment and created a essentially data outline. And I said, if we could get all this into one movie, this is gonna be like the greatest movie ever. Now, as far as post-production and when is it gonna be released, it could be up to four months from now, which could put us into February or March. It might, take, it might not take that much time. Um, so we've gotten a lot of different people to speak on this and it's a fascinating subject there's so many different cases of levitating saints that again if you actually look at the history of the catholic church then you see many people getting canonized where they are made into a saint they are now called a saint and it's because they achieved some type of superhuman feat of some kind and What's also very interesting about this is that the people who were achieving these feats typically were prayerful, you know? They're actually doing something that doesn't get glamorized by the media. In fact, again, I wasn't allowed to talk about this. I never even got to do episodes on Levitating Saints, and I certainly wasn't being encouraged to pursue anything having to do with angels. So it took a long time to really understand what was going on, but when we look throughout the literature, for example, in the case of the second Buddha, Padmasambhava, there were 23 devotees that he had who were apparently flying with him as a group. They would get together, they would levitate, and they literally could fly through the air together. So this is pretty amazing. Let's have some comments. You know, I feel like reading your comments, even though you're going to insult me and probably make me feel bad. Okay, how much snow did you get up there? Oh, my God. Look, right now, the snow is, is crazy. We've got probably, I don't know, four or five inches. And I kind of wanted to get through this whole story about how depressing my trip to L.A. was. Because what I've really decided is I can't live there anytime soon. I mean, right now, 
it's freaking cold here. I've got uh, base layers on, and I am trying really hard to not go outside more than I have to. So, like, for example, I have the warmest Alpine boots you can get, the high-altitude Ever Mount Everest boots. I've got base layers. I've got ski pants. I've got the big winter jacket, the winter hat, the winter gloves. I'm doing all that stuff right now, guys. It's, it is freaking cold outside. When I woke up this morning, it was 11 degrees. 11 degrees is not exactly, let me do it on close up. You know, 11 degrees is not exactly what you want. You know, this is not the kind of fun that I wanted to be having. And so uh, when my divorce happened three years ago, two years ago, I couldn't get out of here. I got stuck here because I just couldn't afford to live anywhere else. And I also wanted to be in a place that was safe in a place that had all of my uh, preparedness supplies. I've got firewood. I've got, I don't know, two months worth of bison ribeye steaks and two freezers I've got out in the garage. I mean, I'm ready. If anything goes down, I'm ready. So like, yeah, it's not easy to leave this country oasis where actually there's a relative amount of stability here and then take off and go out to the largest populated area of the west coast of the united states now i thought i knew what la was all about but when i got out there my whole world got turned upside down and i had originally booked a week but i was so stressed out and freaked out by how incredibly aggressive everybody was that I had to leave. I actually left early. I felt really bad because I had a wonderful host. We were having these amazing conversations. We were hanging out. We were, you know, taking walks around the neighborhood. But by day four, I had to, I had to go. Um, and there was a whole bunch of really strange things that happened to kick me out the door. But again, let's read a little more of your comments here. So, uh, Somebody says, the weather is dry even at 11 degrees. Uh, somebody said, why is there a black screen? I don't know. I mean, it looks fine to me. So if you're seeing black screen, I don't know. Prometheus Productions, the light bringer. Hey, I didn't say that. Kazakhstan crashed out three times on a live stream. I came here to check if all live streams on YouTube were messed up. Well, I don't know. Uh, sorry if you guys aren't seeing it, but it looks like everybody has some degree. Uh, oh, somebody said, if it's not working, just reload the page. Tell us more about LA. Okay. Uh, woo. Well, look, this was bad. Okay. The first thing that happened is that I lost my phone at the airport because the team I was working with did something I would never normally do. They checked me in online. I don't ever do that because I don't think it makes any difference. You're still going to have to go up to the counter you're going to have to show ID. You're going to have to do the baggage check. This is not stuff that I'm in the habit of doing. And I was really scattered because, you know, I found out at the last minute that our shoot time was the following morning at 1030. We could only get the shoot at Monday morning at 1030 in the morning. So I got to fly myself out to L.A. on Sunday. I had to line up a dog sitter. I got that all straightened away had to fly out to LA and then, you know, I have supposedly this Airbnb that I had rented. It looked great on online. And that's kind of what always happens, right? As you look at these pictures and you say, oh yeah, this looks freaking awesome. This looks like this amazing place. It's up on a hill. It's got this big view of Glendale, which was the part of uh, LA that I was going to. What could go wrong, right? Well, what could go wrong? Well, everything went wrong. <clears throat> but let's go back to the airport first, because this is the craziest, most negative travel experience I've ever had in my entire frickin' life, okay? I am not kidding. This was the most negative experience of travel that I've ever had. So, look, I don't know what to tell you guys. I just would say don't go. Right now, don't go to L.A. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. So the first thing that happens is I drive all the way to the airport, which is an hour and 10 minutes. That was fine. Nothing really that eventful happened. Um, and I get to the airport and they had checked me in online. So now you're supposed to check in with your cell phone. 
Well, this is where the problem, you can see if I call the cell phone, that dates me right there. I don't call it a, a mobile or anything else. So I get there and I put my phone on some kind of countertop and then I just freaking walked away and I left it there because I got to check in with my phone, but then that didn't work because the boarding pass didn't work. We're like, sorry, not it's eh, eh, it's not scanning. Okay, well. So the next thing you know, and I actually I'm always worried about the cell phone because it's got a really serious amount of electromagnetic frequencies, and I used to always carry it in my right pocket. Okay, well, I like many other people just didn't really think too much about EMF or radiation, and I just did this behavior and I felt fine with it. And I did it for many years. I lived in LA for 14 years. During that time, it was not like it is now. It's gotten much, much more aggressive, as we'll get to in a minute. But during COVID, for whatever reason, I just said, you know what? I've lived my whole life. I've eaten really healthy. I've eaten really organic my whole life. I've never deviated from this. But during COVID, it's, things are so crazy, and I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to wear any masks. And I hardly ever did. I hardly ever went anywhere. I never left the house. So let's just get takeout. Let's just order takeout. You know, that'll be great. Let's just get takeout to the house, order it to the house. You know, what could go wrong? Well, what started to go wrong was that after only really, I don't know, maybe five months of, of eating that restaurant food every day or a lot of the time, I couldn't tie my shoes anymore. I couldn't freaking tie my shoes. Now, what do you mean you couldn't tie your shoes? Well, I mean, in order to tie your shoes, you have to be able to bend over enough to reach your foot. So the only way that I would even have a chance of doing that was to sit in a chair. But as far as like standing and bending over, I couldn't get more than halfway down. And so it was like every part of my range of motion below about halfway down was completely locked up. Now that is an absolutely terrifying thing to go through. It's just, it was so insane. And I was having my wife, Elizabeth, tie my shoes for me. Really a big problem. So this is when I started my journey into therapeutic massage because it turns out that when I was in fifth grade, these so-called friends of mine pushed me down the ever dangerous and elusive monkey hill. This was the most dangerous ski hill in my town of Scotia, New York. It was way down on the edge of Collins Park next to the fence. And it was a very, very serious and precarious drop. So they shoved me down my snow saucer. I had five so-called friends who did this to me when I was in fifth grade. And I end up not actually taking, you know, you're supposed to lean in when you hit this thing that's like a turn. It's like tobogganing. You gotta, you gotta use your body weight. I didn't know that. So they sent me down really fast, actually dangerously fast, because they all gave me a running start. And I knew Monkey Hill was very dangerous. I knew you're not supposed to go down Monkey Hill, but they basically forced me to do it. And I think they would have beat me up if they if I didn't let them do this. So anyway, I shot down the hill and I hit that ramp and I ended up not using it like a turn, but actually like a uh, an exit ramp <laughs> and I caught air and I caught so much air that I dropped down the entire vertical drop of Monkey Hill, which was about 30 feet in the air. And I landed on my saucer and it shattered into like 30 pieces. And I had massive, massive leg damage. My whole, all the musculature inside my right leg basically turned into something like, you know, stewed tomatoes, let's say. It was an event that changed my whole life because after this happened, I got much darker circles under my eyes. I couldn't walk straight anymore. My right leg was always off to the side. I couldn't roller skate because I couldn't get my legs to go straight. So I had real trouble with that. And I had been hobbling around my whole life. So when I got to Colorado to go to Naropa for a graduate school program, I ended up not getting accepted, but I went out there to apply. I met this guy named Carl, who was a metaphysical person, and he told me, yeah, you're going to need something called rolfing. I'd never heard of rolfing before, but it had been pioneered here in California uh, and in Boulder as well. I said, here in California. I'm not in California. You see, 
being in LA got me thinking like that again. Anyway, it would end up being many years before I got rolfing. I started to get it in Sedona. And what I eventually discovered was that most of my right leg had been atrophied and that the tissue didn't even, it wasn't even alive. I didn't have blood flow going through most of the muscles in my leg. And apparently this for me was the reason why I had dark circles under my eyes. So people have been asking me, David, you look so much healthier. Your eyes look so much lighter. You don't have this dark color under your eyes. And then some people are like saying, oh, it's all makeup. Well, no, it's not. I actually don't have the circles anymore. It's really amazing. And I, I had gone to a, you know, cosmetologist and said, hey, is there any treatment you can do for this thing with my eyes? Because people don't like it. You know, they think that it makes me look bad. What can I do? And it turns out that she was telling me, you can't fix this cosmetically. You can't treat the skin and fix the problem, you actually have to go to the root of the issue. And the root of the issue apparently, in her mind, was all internal and systemic. So one of the things that I did uh, that really was a big game changer for me was I stopped eating grains. I stopped eating sediment. There's a whole thing in the Law of One series. If you know my background, the Law of One is my go-to source text. It's something that has five different books. They were all intuitively derived from 1981 to 1983 by a group calling themselves LL Research. And I love the Law of One. For me, when I found it in 1996, it consolidated many years of metaphysical study. It emphasizes the best aspects of East and Western spirituality. So you get meditation, you get Buddhist philosophy, you get the concept of emptiness, you get the idea of an intelligent universe, that the cosmos is alive, that there's a consciousness to it. One of the things they say is there is only identity. Then they talk about how we're living in something called third density and that there's actually, much like in a Nintendo game, it dates me again, right? I remember the original Nintendo. I even had an Atari VCS. Even before they called it 2600, I had the Atari VCS. Okay, that shows you how old I am. I was born in 1973. I was excited about the Atari VCS. I was excited about Nintendo when it first came out. It was a big game changer. But like a Nintendo game, you know, you got to jump for those mushrooms. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, they have mushrooms in there and you can eat those mushrooms in Super Mario Brothers. But it's not, you know, whether it makes you shoot fire or anything, that's a whole other story. But suffice it to say that my life, as I got more and more advanced and I got more and more into my practice, I started to realize that, no, you know, I'm not really in the best health I could be in. And one of the key things, as the Law of One talks about, is that you don't want to eat sediment. They were specifically telling Carla she had rheumatoid arthritis and there was all these problems happening with her body. And they told her, please stay away from sediment. So in modern times, we have the work of Dr. William Davis, who wrote a book called Wheat Belly. And if you haven't seen that or been familiar with his information, I highly recommend that you check it out. Because what he discovered was that there is a protein in wheat called gliadin, G-L-I-A-D-I-N. And maybe this was just something that accidentally happened, or maybe it was intentional. You know which one I think. But the point is that gliadin changes the way that your body works. And what it does is it mimics the thyroid receptors, T1, T2, T3, and T4. As you learn, if you study things like chronic fatigue syndrome, Epstein-Barr, that kind of stuff, which I did, you can have these very serious issues developing in the body that are caused ultimately by, many people believe, to be wheat consumption. So this, this protein gliadin actually goes into your thyroid and is taken in in place of T1, T2, T3, T4. So most people don't really understand this, but if your thyroid isn't getting those hormones, you will not have energy. You'll be bored, you'll be listless, you'll be depressed, you won't feel good at all, pretty much. And this leads to the so-called chronic fatigue syndrome. Well. You know, there's a pretty easy solution for that. Stop eating wheat, and then you stop eating gliadin, which means it stops replacing the thyroid hormones. But it goes even farther than that. It goes even farther than that because there's so many reasons why you don't want to have grain. 
and I really don't. My diet now consists of meat, vegetables, fruit, very, very little grain. In fact, I think part of what damaged me on this trip to LA is I was eating lots of white rice. I kept getting sushi takeout, and so I had sashimi, and then I'd have sushi rolls that were made with white rice. And actually, this is so funny, but just before, I have been so constipated. I mean, just before, I, I've probably spent 45 minutes trying to get this latest one that's on deck out of me, and I just can't do it. I'm just sitting there just freaking going crazy. Well, that's because I ate a bunch of this, of this rice, you know, and so I'm not used to doing that. Now, what this cosmetologist told me was, she, she mentioned stopping all eating of grain as the main thing that I needed to do to heal the circles under my eyes. Now, it turns out that it was a combination of that, hot baths, and this rolfing or massage, therapeutic massage, but they all kind of are interrelated. So let's, let's talk about this one by one. It's not just that wheat has gliadin, and it's not just that the gliadin is something that replaces the thyroid hormones, and then when your thyroid takes up gliadin, you're not getting any energy. It's not filling the responsibilities that it's supposed to fulfill. So it's a big problem. Another thing that happens when you eat grain, and this is very specific to the dry, hard stuff like chips, bread, breakfast cereal. If you eat any of that kind of stuff, it stays hard. It doesn't really hydrate when it gets into your body. This is a very, very important point. Then it goes into your gut, and your gut lining consists of one layer of cells. That's it. Believe it or not, the lining of your small intestine, it's not two cells thick, it's not three cells thick, it's one cell layer thick. That's it. And then, as you go further into this research, what you find out is that the only thing that's protecting that one layer of cells, and remember, just to try to think about it, it's only one layer of cells and you might have these hard chips, like let's say you ate corn chips, let's say you had Doritos, right? There's all these edges, right? When you're chewing on Doritos, they turn into all these little tiny sharp pieces. Well, guess what? You're throwing that into your gut, and what it does is it scrapes off the mucosal lining that's inside your colon and your small intestine. Now, why does that matter? If you don't have that mucus, then you're now directly exposing the actual single layer of cells that your small intestine is made out of to these food particles. There's no mucus in the way. Now that is very, very, very bad. Why is that so bad? Well, there's a couple different reasons. First of all, there is this compound called zonulin, okay, Z-O-N-U-L-I-N, and that is a compound that holds together the cells in that single layer of membrane. I was originally actually going to sell this information in a course, but I'm just doing it for free because, like, I really think everybody needs to know this. And you could build a really big wellness program around this and help people. In fact, the woman I was staying with had just gotten off of all grain because if you keep on going this way, you can have very serious health problems, which she was. She was she'd lost her ability to see for a while. Her eyes started swelling up. So she was on a diet that was basically just red meat and eggs and butter and water. And I mean, there wasn't a whole lot else in the house besides that. And that was part of the problem is I ended up running out of food. Uh, and I, because I lost my phone and all these other crazy things happened. But I want to talk to you quite a bit about how to heal yourself because nobody's going to tell you this. I want to tell you this. I'm not going to sell it to you. It's free. Here it is. I, I also promised this in some of my other courses. And I kind of touched on it before, but not as much as I'm doing right now. I know it's a big ask. I know it's really hard to give up grain. It's almost impossible. People don't want to do it. There's so many things that are made with wheat. You just don't want to give that up. And I get that. But if you do give it up, the results are absolutely phenomenal in terms of what's going to happen to your health. I mean, look at how much nicer my face looks, honestly, than it did before. I had very dark circles under my eyes. I'd cover it with makeup. But you still could see. I mean, it wasn't like I was really hiding anything. And if I took a picture when I didn't have makeup on, I looked like I had, I don't know, some kind of degenerative condition, some kind of disease or something. It didn't look good. 
So again, in my case, a lot of it was that my whole right leg was all jammed up and blood flow isn't even going through those muscles. It's essentially atrophied tissue because of this catastrophic injury that I had on my snow saucer. So let's go back to the fact that there's the zonulin that holds these various bounds together between cells in the single layer of cell lining that's in your intestines. And the only thing protecting that cell layer is mucus. So if you eat stuff that's sharp, if you eat stuff that's, that's dry and hard and made out of, this, out of this wheat, then guess what happens? The wheat and the other types of food particles, it won't just be wheat, they begin irritating the cell wall because that cell wall is not built to be exposed to food. It's built to be covered by mucus. This really will save your life. I mean, the information I'm telling you right now could actually save your life, and it could drastically, drastically improve your health on anything that you're thinking about. So what happens is the food becomes irritation because now those cell linings are not being covered up by mucus. So when you have this food that's got like, you know, spicy food or again, grain, any type of grain, it starts to actually irritate and create this redness, this, this red irritation in the zonulin bonds between the cells. And this is where things get to be terrible, folks, because the zonulin breaks down and openings appear between the cells in your gut lining. Now, what does that mean? That means that now you have undigested food particles that are going directly into your gut. Well, I'm sorry, undigested food particles going directly into your bloodstream. The food enters into your bloodstream without being digested. So if you look at a typical, sad, standard American diet person, SAD, standard American diet, sad, right? If you look at a typical standard American diet, they've got hardly any gut lining left. They don't have that mucus. There's all this irritation. There's these large streaks of, of red irritation inside. And as the food hits that, it's going directly in your bloodstream. Now what happens? Now that the foodborne particles are in your bloodstream, bloodborne food particles in your, in your bloodstream, in some cases, they can actually go through the blood-brain barrier. <coughs> <coughs> See, this is what I'm fighting against. It's a, I got a really bad cough, sore throat, all kinds of stuff. So I got to be careful about how loud I talk. But hey, if I want to do an hour, I'm already halfway done. And I'm saving your life. This is information that will actually save your life. So, wow. When I started to learn this, it's like, okay, wait a minute. What happens once the undigested food gets into your bloodstream? Well... When you get this thing starting to happen, they, they rot in your bloodstream. It's not like it stays fresh. So you have toxic particles in your blood and they will eventually break down the blood brain barrier and get into your, into your brain, creating fungus. And in fact, just on the front page of, I believe it was Zero Hedge, I think it was yesterday. It's one of the websites I usually go to. They had a fascinating thing on there from the Epoch Times where they were validating a major point that I made in my Michael Prophecies books about the idea that things like autism, Asperger's syndrome, Parkinson's disease, and many other conditions that can be debilitating to people, including chronic depression, chronic fatigue, could actually be related to these blood-borne food particles. Now, one of the interesting strategies that, that uh, will be done to cause this to go away is you can take extra enzymes in between meals. And then what happens is the enzymes will actually get into your bloodstream if you don't have any other food in there, and they will begin digesting those particles in your blood. So one of the common things, if you paid a lot of money and went to a naturopathic doctor, and they start to analyze you and they say, yeah, it looks like you got this, this same issue a lot of other people have. You know, you feel bloated, you're, you can't get your weight down, you have these dark circles under your eyes, you have skin problems. All of these things like acne, skin rashes, all that stuff is very much related to 
what can happen when these particles are in your bloodstream. Another thing that was fascinating in the Zero Hedge study was that after only 10 days in a mouse study, when they were able to, you know, treat the mice for 10 days to give them, I guess, some kind of antifungal, they were able to completely lose all the fungus in their brains. But again, fungus in the brain also appears correlated with the traumata of psychopathy. Psychopaths are 4% of men, 2% of women. That's the historical numbers that you get in psychology class. It could very well be more like, you know, 5 to 6% of men and 3% of women by now. Because as conditions in the world change, it, it makes people more unstable. But a psychopath is a person who really doesn't have compassion for others. They live their lives looking for how other people can benefit them, for how they can make money, hurt you, create abuse. They're very into being nasty and creating arguments and problems. And so I studied this academically in college, and it's pretty clear to me that when we look at the problems we see in the world today, much of them are caused by psychopaths. And it is actually a treatable condition, believe it or not. If you can lower the amount of fungus in your blood, then you will have less psychopathy because psychopathy is correlated with, as I discovered when I finally went through and did this massive review of clinical literature, 17 different regions of the brain that are adversely affected by this condition. And in short, psychopathy is caused by the body creating a workaround when you've just had too much stress, too much trauma, you're too messed up in the mind, you can't handle any more stress at all. And so your brain says, you know what, let's just not even worry about it. I'm just not even going to let you feel these emotions. When most people would feel terrified, you're not going to feel terrified. When most people would feel sad, you're not going to feel sad. I'm just going to shut these things down so that you can handle basically being in a war zone, having lots of trauma, and not having a problem, and you just keep on going. Well, now, I mean, I don't want to throw myself under the bus here, but I think I had some psychopathy from living in L.A. But now when I go back there, it's like, oh, my God. Everybody is super aggressive. Everybody is trying to rob you. I had, I lost my car keys. I lost my phone. I spent almost the entire trip trying to rebuild my life to figure out how to get the phone. And then that was a whole huge ordeal. We'll go through that a little bit. But yeah, your brain will knock it, off, knock it off. It'll say, you know what? We don't need to be worried about this. Somebody's yelling you in your face. We don't need to care. We don't need to be all upset about it. We're not going to even create adrenaline. Just whatever. Oh, somebody just tried to kill you on the highway? I mean, one of the craziest things that happened, this actually did happen right in Glendale. This beautiful city. I mean, it's like Glendale is amazing. It looked, The trees look like Beverly Hills. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, a lot of L.A. was developed in the 20s and 30s, and they planted a bunch of trees there. And so there's places like parts of Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, Bel Air, and Glendale, where you have these amazing old growth trees on the road. And so that's a very nice feature. I want to be around trees. There's people out there who can help me. So I was like, you know, I could have a community out here. I've got a team. We're working on the movie together. Maybe I could get out of this crazy snowmageddon hellhole that I've been in where it's eight months of winter a year. Because when I went out to L.A., it was fine. I mean, the weather's like 78 degrees. It's like summertime. People are still running their air conditioners over there. But wow, what a nightmare. At one point, I tried to pull onto the road. And I say tried, right? It's a 30-mile-an-hour zone. I think it was Glendale Avenue. I think that was the road. And... uh this guy comes up behind me and he is speeding so much that first of all, I couldn't even see him. Like I'm pulling onto the road and his car was way the hell down there, but he's going so fast that God forbid he had to stop speeding. He had to slow down for somebody to pull onto the road. Well, this guy got mad at me and he honked his horn and I learned a long time ago, never flip off the Armenians. Okay. Cause if you live in if you live in Burbank or if you live in Glendale, it's 90% Armenian. I'm not racist. I love them. Okay. But it's also true that they can be very uh, hot-headed. They can, they can get aggressive really easily. So you don't want to ever get into a fight with the Armenians. You just don't. I mean, for example, 
everybody says, you know, if you live in an Armenian neighborhood, you're never going to have to worry about crime because if somebody starts doing anything crazy, they'll just come out of their house and shoot you. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's really true. I mean, if it was, you'd hear a lot more about it. But that's the, that's the sophism. So, again, I have no problem with the Armenians. I, I love these people, and that's why I'm willing to live there again. But not if there's people trying to kill me. So I made a bad mistake, and I flipped him off. I was just kind of in the moment. I wasn't really thinking. I forgot that I was in Los Angeles, and it was so ridiculous. Like, dude, you had like 700 feet. You were at least 750 feet behind me. I pull out on a 30-mile-an-hour zone, and you're all freaking mad. So I flipped him off, and he's all freaking crazy. He, he gets all mad. He's all crazy. So I'm like, you know, I better get the hell away from this guy. I don't want to be behind this guy anymore. But I also, by this point, I didn't have my phone. I only could use the GPS that was in the rental car. I didn't want to get lost. I had no idea when I left the house if I was ever going to be able to make it back. And part of the really crazy stuff that was going on was that the GPS allowed me to get to my address once, and then it never allowed me to put in the name of the street that I was living on again. We'll say Glendale Avenue. That wasn't the street I was on, but we'll just say it was Glendale Avenue. So you, you're trying to put in this street, and the GPS did it once, and it gets you to the house, but then you can't get back there again. Now I got to go get a phone because I don't have one, and the only way I'm ever going to make it back to the house is if the phone works. And I'm leaving on this trip to go try to get that done. And I'm like, well, I don't even know how I'm going to remember how to get out of here. I got to try to make sure I'm driving on the right street. So I don't want this guy, like, getting in my way. So I took a right, and he kept on going straight on Glendale. Okay, thank God. Maybe I wasn't thinking clearly, and maybe I was driving faster than he was, because I go around the next block, I go up one road, take a left, and now I'm trying to get back onto Glendale Avenue again, and wouldn't you know, right as I get to the intersection, there he is, there he is, same freaking guy. And I'm telling you what, this guy was ready to get out of the car and fight me. And I had these glasses that were made by the chainsaw manufacturer, Steel, S-T-I-H-L, and they wrap around like all the way back to here on your face so that there's no glare that gets in on the sides. They look military, they look kind of scary, so this guy, he pulls up to the intersection. I pull up to the intersection. I got this crazy curly hair. I got these crazy glasses. I got my, you know, rugged looking military jacket. And this guy is ready to kill me. I mean, he literally, if I had gotten out of the car, he would have gotten out of the car and I'd be fighting some strange guy. Most of these guys lift weights. Not that that would necessarily get him an advantage because I have five years of martial arts training and we didn't do anything that was non-lethal. You know, I didn't do sparring or tournaments or any of that stuff. I only focused on devastate the opponent in three seconds or less. That was our training. That's what we did. So I certainly know how to devastate somebody. But then again, it's like, well, I don't want to devastate this guy. If I hurt him more than he hurts me, he could sue me. I could lose my whole life over this thing. So he's like ready to fight me and he's not, he's not moving past the intersection. So I'm sitting there and he's sitting there and he's not going to drive and I'm not going to drive. And so I just looked at him and I just started nodding my head like, come and get it, guy, come and get it. I'm nodding my head. I mean, this was freaking crazy. Come and get it. And, I, and he knew I was ready because I was nodding my head like that. And he eventually freaking took off and kept driving. If he'd gotten out of the car, to be honest with you, I probably would have just sped off and tried to use that to my advantage. And then we're into more like, a, well, can he shoot at me kind of thing while I'm driving away from him? I don't know. Hope that's not going to happen. But like, what was my crime? You know, I pulled out onto the road <laughs> in a 30 mile an hour zone. And that was just one of the things that happened. So many th crazy things happened. So anyway, let's go back to the gut lining. And I want to finish that story because <clears throat> all these things are interrelated. This is so funny. Anyway, when you look at how to heal yourself, it turns out that stopping eating grain will save your life. It'll save your life from all sorts of chronic degenerative conditions. And I do believe there's a whole lot of research that was done into this mechanism. And that's why it's so hard to learn about this. And that's why typically you have to go 
to somebody who's in the know, like a naturopathic doctor. You're not going to get this from allopathic doctors. Nobody's going to talk about, you know, food particles in your bloodstream. Nobody's going to talk about permeable gut lining. Nobody's going to talk about fungus in the brain and this systemic candida yeast situation that you can end up getting. Like, for example, if you have, like, itchy pain on the corners of your mouth, that's, that's systemic yeast. That's one of the ways you can tell. Another way you can tell is that your ear canals start to itch. So if you have either of those conditions, then you absolutely must stop eating grain. That I would say right off the bat. If you got these little, ah, that always hurts. Nope. Same thing with the ear canals. If, if your ear canals are always itching, that means you have a systemic infection. And almost everybody does, because the food that we eat is designed to do this. So this greatly reduces your lifespan because now you have toxic pathogenic particles that build up in your various organs, including the brain, including the thyroid, endocrine system, you name it. So you really don't want to have to be stuck with this condition if there's any way you can avoid it. And the only way you can avoid it is to not eat grain. So I really do agree with Pete Peterson. He was telling me that in 1996 on a Christian TBN radio show called Tower of Power, in 1996, that six different whistleblowers came forward from a major agricultural giant called Archer Daniels Midland. And they testified on this show, and I've said this before, nobody's been able to find the episode yet. I think we probably can, and I'd love to. Uh, it would take some research. But anyway, they came forward as whistleblowers. They probably all died afterwards, honestly. But what they said was that they were tasked with weaponizing the human food supply and that they specifically were looking at ways to take wheat and turn it into something that was a killer. So when you combine that testimony in 1996 with Dr. William Davis's discoveries about gliadin and the idea that your thyroid starts taking this stuff up because it mimics T1, T2, T3, and T4, yeah, that starts to look like it might have been intentional. And that was Pete's contention was that it was. In the early 1970s, the DS got this idea, hey, we need to lower the numbers, we need to earth to shake off its flea problem, as Uncle Jack would say, mate, we got to have the earth shake off its fleas. That would make me upset when he would say stuff like that. It's like, dude, you're talking about human lives. You can't analogize people to insects like this. It doesn't make any sense. Or it does if you're an evil psychopath, I guess. So there's food out there all the time that you really don't want to have. Non-organic food, for example, has all this glyphosate in it and all these things that are really, really bad for you. So there's a documentary, as I talked about, uh, called Secret Ingredients, and you can go rent that, pay for it, watch it. And in Secret Ingredients, you have a family who is otherwise very healthy. They're eating conventional produce. They're jogging. They're doing marathon running, and they're all, like, dying. They're all just very, very sick. The dog is sick, the kids are sick, everybody's really sick. They only did one thing different. They stopped eating conventional produce and they went to organic produce. So yes, it costs more. Yes, it's harder to get. Yes, you have less selection. There might be a little organic section in the grocery store and maybe you only get like, I don't know, chard and broccoli and certain types of fruit and then everything else is conventional. Well, don't eat the conventional. In the movie Secret Ingredients, what they reveal is that when this family stopped eating the conventional produce and went organic, all of their health problems went away. It's a very good idea to stop living in denial and understand that there are very easily achieved weapons out there that you can be ingesting and not even realize it. They've deployed them into the field. They've done this on purpose because they want fewer people. So there's a very nasty thing having to do with wheat and grains in general. And so I don't really eat any grain at all. And as a result, I used to have, I mean, I don't want to really admit this, but I used to have acne on my back. It wasn't bad. I'd get it mostly up here on my shoulders. I'd get it kind of on my neck sometimes. But when I stopped doing this, when I stopped eating grain, pretty much all the acne went away. I don't have any acne at all now. It's really amazing. And again, the really amazing result was getting rid of the dark circles. It was interesting when I was doing shoots with Gaia and I had a makeup lady, Suzanne, that we would go to lunch and after lunch, she would have to put more makeup under my eyes because the dark circles would get darker after I ate food. 
And this again was proof positive that my gut lining was permeable. And as soon as I would eat food, I would get these new particles that would show up in my, in my blood. And typically one of the common things you hear about what is dark circles, they say that it has to do with capillaries. There's a lot of very, very thin blood vessels under your eyes right here. And if those blood vessels get damaged by, for example, foodborne particles, then they can become leaky. And there's holes in the capillaries and those holes are big enough for what? For red blood cells to come out. And once you start leaking red blood cells into this cavity under your eye, it creates pigmentation, it creates darkness. So you actually want to nourish your health, you want to nourish the bloodstream so that you don't have particles in your blood, so that you don't create injuries in these capillaries where, you know, they've been trying to heal, they've been trying to heal, but then all of a sudden they get hit with more particles, they break open again, and now you have more red blood cells dumping into this ocular cavity. Well, in order to not have your capillaries break down, in order to have them not leak these red blood cells, you need to have clean blood. You don't want to have this stuff in your blood. So again, one of the common treatments is there are certain types of enzymes that you take in between meals, and they will get into your bloodstream directly, and they will actually attack and digest these particles in your blood. So that's one of the things that the naturopath will usually recommend for you. But the hard one really is just getting over the fact that you can't have anything that breaks down into little particles. You don't want anything that could irritate. Because remember, the main goal that you have is to not have that mucus lining get scrubbed off. Once your mucus lining is scrubbed off, it's, there's going to be food particles in your blood. There's nothing you can do about it. And it's so interrelated with all different types, every type of disease you can imagine is somehow correlated with this because this creates systemic conditions that lead to the outcropping of disease of a variety of different types. Let me see your comments again here, just to make sure I'm still going. Don't move to LA, it's toxic in all aspects. It's very sad, I would say so. Somebody said, Dr. Joel Wallach is awesome in his website, Critical Health. He says, most diseases are caused by us not ingesting proper vitamins and minerals, mind-blowing stuff. Deanna Dragovich says, thank you for talking about this very recent subject that I've been discussing. And somebody says, yeah, the problem isn't grains itself, it's the chemicals they put on them to prevent bugs from eating them, and of course, GMO grains. And then somebody says, appreciate you, David, for taking the time to give us some free nutritional information to save and improve our lives at no cost. A naturopath would charge $200 for consultation. Yeah, I would love for you to learn this and actually practice this because... I mean, I don't really get sick anymore. This is the closest to getting sick that I've been. And another trick that I was using last night, I, I, I didn't even know if I'd be able to do this show. I had no voice, honestly. I used honeycomb honey that was raw organic. And every single time I took the raw organic honey and I, and I you know, put it in my mouth, and, and I would recommend not heating it up and putting it in water, actually. Just do the raw honey and apply it directly. Honey is designed to prevent infection for these little gross larvae that are inside the honeycombs. So the honey is there as a food for them, but it also is a disinfectant. That's why you can put honey on a wound and actually it will work as a wound healer. Well, sure enough, I was doing wound healing in my mouth. And so I was up, I got up at 1230 last night. I went to bed at 730 because I was so tired and sick. And I got up at 1230 and I just began doing the honeycomb every 15 minutes as soon as the pain would come back. And now, I mean, look at me, I'm talking and everything is really good. Somebody just said, Sarah, peptase will digest food, food particles. The water used to water organic vegetables is tainted. Bless your food, raise your vibe. It's called gluten, which is a lectin, which is a plant and nutrient. Do you eat oats anymore? Well, oats is another one that's apparently bad for the gut. So I just would recommend really try to stay away from grain entirely. If you want to know what I eat, I typically will either have uh, chicken for breakfast with sautéed onions, and I reheat the chicken that I'd already heated up before. I just did that this morning. Or I'll have eggs and maybe breakfast sausage, uh, but I always make onions. And so this is another thing. 
Archangel Michael recommended that I start eating half an onion or like a third of an onion, depending on its size, with every meal. You saute the onion and you want to do it slowly. And I also like to use coconut water as a reduction. Coconut water creates an amazing, marvelous onion flavor. Just a little bit of sesame oil, a little bit of salt and a little coconut water towards the end when the onion is starting to get burnt. And I typically cook my onions on high. You don't need to reduce the heat unless you're doing it all in one pan and then you're going to put the meat in. You leave it on high at first to get the meat heated up and then you turn it down to medium. And you want to let it cook enough that you're actually, your meat is, is warm enough. That's the biggest problem. But then the, the trick also is can you get the onions going and the meat going in one dish? And I've gotten pretty good at that. But the reason why I focus on eating onions is that they are the best natural source of quercetin, which if you study all this literature is certainly implicated as being one of the best, if not the best nutrients to take to prevent against COVID and the damage associated with treatments related to COVID. So for me, onions are a superfood. I think they're a neglected superfood, but if you eat onions all the time, you're getting that quercetin and supposedly, you know, these are the zinc ionophores. And once you start having those, then you're not going to get sick anymore. And for the most part, I don't. In fact, I didn't eat onions this past week and then I did get sick. I'm sicker right now than I've been in probably the whole time since I got here two years ago and moved out to this house when I started doing my show with Chris, The Disclosure. So, yeah, it's very important that you avoid grain intake. That's, that's really key. And it's very important also that you eat organic. As I said, those are probably the two most important things, is eating organic and not eating grain. Next in line, I would say, is making sure that your water is really good, really clear, really pure. You don't want to have a lot of nasty particles in your water either. You, you're trying to find a way to live your life with as much healthy input of nutrition as possible. And so I do think it's a good idea to drink lots of water, but also it's very important that you don't uh, rinse out your enzymes. So when you eat a food, you want to wait 45 minutes before you drink any water at all. And if you have to drink anything before then, you can only do small sips. This is another really big thing that if I tell you this right now, it'll save your life. In Virginia Beach, we had a practitioner named Sandra Dugan, and Sandra had saved people's lives who were dying of things like colitis, Crohn's disease, diabetes, leukemia, you name it. And it was all dietary. So in addition to, if you want to do the whole David Wilcock protocol, I'm just going to give it to you. <clears throat> in addition to not eating grain and in addition to making sure that you eat organic, the next big thing on the list is that you do not want to drink water for 45 minutes before you eat and for two hours after you eat, ideally. Ideally two hours after. Now, if you, if you can only wait 45 minutes, it's probably okay. I usually don't wait, honestly, more than a half an hour, 45 minutes most of the time. I just have impatience with it. But this is very important. You have a pancreas that uh, creates enzymes, and then that's stored by your gallbladder. And the gallbladder then releases these digestive compounds into your stomach after you eat. But if you drink water while you're eating, those enzymes are water soluble and they get picked up on the water and they rinse right out. And now the enzymes that your food needs to be digested are not there in your gut and your food doesn't digest. And the next thing you know, you end up with degenerative disease conditions. This is really true. So is there a solution for this? Yeah, it's, it's annoying, but again, no water for ideally 45 minutes, and I'll let it flex to a half an hour before you eat. You don't drink any large amount of water, because if you do, there's still enough water in there to rinse away the enzymes when you eat. And then for two hours afterwards, that's where most people really fall down. And I admit up here, I just get tired of waiting, and I don't want to wait that long, because I eat maybe at like, you know, 7 o'clock, 7.30, and I want to be to bed by like 9. That's what I've been doing. Up here, you want to get as much sun as you can. And this type of year, you know, this type of the season, it's just dark all the time. So you don't really want to be asleep when the sun is up. And that's why I end up going to bed at 9 or 9.30 and getting up sometimes as early as 4.30 in the morning, sometimes a little later than that, hopefully. So 
This is a very important thing. Your enzymes are critical, and in fact, I would also highly recommend, beyond any shadow of a doubt, every time you eat a meal, take enzyme pills at the end. Take enzyme supplementation, because your body usually doesn't have enough enzymes, and so the one that I typically use is Digest Gold. Uh, you'll find that in the health food store. I'm not paid. There's no endorsement here. But you really want to not avoid those enzyme supplements because what's going to happen is that you're going to digest a lot more nutrition out of the same food. So like imagine if you could decide that you're going to have twice as much fun when you go out on this drive that you would have had if you didn't have twice as much fun. You get in your car, now you're going to have twice as much fun. Well, that would be pretty awesome if you could find a way to have twice as much fun. Well, what if you had a way to get twice as much nutrition? What if you could eat the same food that you're already eating, but you're getting a hell of a lot more nutritional value out of your food? That's what this does. If you practice these three things, which again is that you're not eating grain, you're only eating organic, and you follow the water protocol, your health will immediately start improving. You'll sleep better. Your mood and attitude and emotions will get better. You'll just feel so much more alive, so much more happy. And look at that, I've already done one hour. I mean, I'm, I'm actually getting healthier as I talk here. It's like my, my nervous system, my immune system is cleaning up all this junk that I had from being in Los Angeles. So once you've dialed in these three things, it's also about the choices of food, you know, and, and not overeating. You don't want to eat a lot of sugar. That's probably another really big thing. I have limited amounts of sugar, and I'm very, very careful about the sugar that I eat. So... If you are overweight, and I used to be 225 pounds at five foot nine, I had man boobs, I had the you know big spare tire roll of fat on the bottom, three rolls, you know, each one bigger than the one above it. That was me. You know, I was the fat kid, and that's why I learned how to be funny and entertaining in order to have friends, because otherwise nobody would want to hang out with me. Because this was the 80s and nobody was overweight back then, so I was the fat kid. So I learned ultimately some very valuable skills because I didn't want to be alone. I wanted to have friends. I learned how to make people laugh, how to be highly entertaining, and how to have fun. But again, if you could get double the value out of the food that you're already eating, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, the answer is yes, you can. And you just put these enzymes in and follow these protocols. And again, another one that would probably be number four, because it's just as important as the others, and I've learned how to follow this, is do not eat any regular sugar at all. If it says high fructose corn syrup, do not eat it. If it says sugar, do not eat it. The only types of sweeteners that you really want to mess with are things like brown rice syrup, molasses. Even when they say agave nectar, no, nah, it's refined. It's the same kind of thing. Refined sugar really, really does a number on your body. And if you want to see the proof of that, go watch this documentary called Fed Up with Katie Couric. And you'll see how these kids are getting diabetes in high school. But then you look at what's happening and they're getting fast food in their school and they're getting sugar in their school. So for me, this one is so old fashioned that I don't even really talk about it most of the time, but yeah, you don't want to eat sugar at all. And so like I have these uh, Mary Bites from Hail Mary is the company and they're all sweetened with maple syrup. Maple syrup is great. There's no other sweetener included. So I get the Mary Bites, you know, the coconut bites, I get the the little tarts that they make, the lemon ones and the pumpkin ones, and I know that the sweeteners are good. And interestingly enough, if you eat the right kind of sweets, you don't get the negative effects of sugar. You don't get the blood sugar crash. You don't get the, the hunger issue. You don't get the candida itchiness on the sides of your mouth or in your ear canals. All that stuff goes away. Skin problems reduce. So in the movie Fed Up with Katie Couric, once again, the bottom line in this case was sugar is poison. It's very dangerous. We shouldn't be eating it. Why in the hell is it put into everything? If you eat this stuff, you're going to die. So I really couldn't stress enough. If you want to have a happier, better life, just whatever the hell it is, just switch to something that's healthier and easier to digest. And so again, brown rice syrup is good. Honey is fine. You can have honey. You can have maple syrup. You can have molasses. And I would even say, you know, there's, there's other things you can find like Lakanto, 
you can get Lakanto sugar, you can get Lakanto syrup. I actually was sponsored by the Lakanto company at one point uh, for one of my conferences, and I pushed their products because I do believe in that. So there's things you can do. In other words, you don't have to be subject to NutraSweet or aspartame. There's other types of sweeteners that work better. And then, of course, you can go down the stevia rabbit hole. There was a period of time where I was doing stevia liquid, and then at my house in California, I had these Meyer lemon bushes that were amazing. I mean, I always had lemons. I always had way more lemons than I could eat or use. And so another thing that is considered one of the Edgar Casey remedies is to have a glass of lemon juice in water. And if you sweeten it with stevia, you can kind of get away with not putting anything else in there and it still tastes like lemonade. That's pretty awesome. So I do follow all these things and I believe that these conditions were part of why Michael Prophecies came in. Once the Michael Prophecy contact started to happen, he's also telling me that I needed to fix all the damage in my muscle tissue. <coughs> I am going to lose my voice pretty soon. I can feel it coming. <laughs> So we're just going to keep going until something goes wrong. But I wanted to get through this content. So, yeah, there's a lot of things you want to do. You want to make sure you're getting enough sleep. And part of that also is that you don't want to have any lights on in the room at night. So any little LEDs that are beaming light into the room, they might actually diminish your circadian rhythm. So here I was at the Marriott Hotel on the first night when I got to L.A. after I went to my Airbnb. And I open up the door. Cat! Ah! Cat! Cat, cat! Ah! Ah! Cat smell! Ah! That's what it was like when I got in there. Oh, my God, did it smell bad. Oh, my God, did it smell bad. Ah, it's just amazingly intense cat box odor. I, I open up the house. I'm like, oh, my God, how am I even going to sleep in this place? And then I find out that the Glendale Freeway, the Highway 2, is right next to it, like 100 feet away. The noise was so loud. The cars were so loud because I'm up on a hill, and here's this highway right down here. So there's a direct, unencumbered line of just air between all these cars on this. I think it was a six-lane highway. It might have even been eight, but it was at least six. And they're running all day and all night. And every single time that one goes by, you hear it in the house. I also go in there, and the house is sweltering hot. So it's like, wait a minute. I rented this for the week. I gave you guys $4,000, what it was. I paid up front. And I walk into the house, and they didn't even turn the air conditioning on, but they had one of those leaf thermostats where they could have totally done it online. So I get in there, and it's this overpoweringly bad cat smell. And I'm already hearing the traffic. And then it's like, well, it's so freaking hot in here. The only way I might be able to sleep in this stench is if I can air out the house and get the temperature down. So then when you open up the windows, of course, now the, the cars are like just really, really incredibly loud. And I realized like, you know what? Even when the windows are closed and even when my earplugs are in, this place is just very noisy and incredibly, incredibly bad smelling. And I cannot do this. I was out of there in 10 minutes. I packed up all my stuff got the hell out of there, and I never went back. <laughs> and then I, I was trying to be polite to the guy, and, you know, maybe you should be a little bit mean. I was trying to be really nice. And the guy saw my, you know, niceness as a weakness, and he actually wrote this back to me. I almost want to take a screen capture of it, but I did get some of my money back. But the guy actually said, he didn't say the word steal. If I keep all of your money... He said this to me. Are you ready for this? I'm going to let me get it on intense camera. If I keep all of your money, will you write a bad review? This is $4,000. I was in the house for 10 effing minutes. This guy, this very wonderful man, asked me if I would write him a negative review if he stole $4,000. I don't have $4,000. I haven't had $4,000. It's a lot of freaking money. 
I mean, I, as, as you guys heard in some of my previous shows, I, I, am, I am hopelessly in debt. The only way I can ever get out of the debt, which is entirely taxes, okay? There's nothing else going on but taxes. And I'm already seeing people create these conspiracy theories. There was some of the trolls online were trying to say that people had given me money for hover cars and I didn't deliver on the hover car. That is absolutely not true. All right? The bottom line is Joe Biden paid 400000 in taxes. I paid 839000 in taxes in one year. And so it's kind of interesting that I pay twice as much as Biden in taxes. Does that make me twice as valuable to America as Biden? Well, you can be the judge of that. I don't know. The point is, yeah, I was doing these events, as I've told you guys before. I averaged about one and a half million off of these. You can't even get close to that, not even, you know, 10% of that now. But... Back when everybody still had an economy, back when everybody still had disposable income, yeah, I found out that I could do these online conferences. And you can, you can only really do this if you're a big public figure. I've got Ancient Aliens. I'm in over 100 episodes. If there's a television on and it's on History Channel, you're going to see me sooner or later. So when you have that level of exposure, this is actually something that works. And again, if you want to get mad at me, oh my God, David's making money. People just get mad that I'm making money. Well, how did I pay for this? How did I pay for these cameras? How did I have the ability to go from one to the other like this, or maybe even another one? Well, it's, it's, I bought these, right? And so some of the trolls online basically don't feel that you should ever be able to be paid for making art. But I would say to you trolls, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could get paid for making art? Wouldn't it be cool if you could go out there and actually do what you want? and make a living out of it and not have to be beholden to a boss or living with your parents because, well, I just can't afford to live by myself. And I get that. I mean, it's, it's very intense. So this guy wants to steal $4,000. I'm like, are you out of your freaking mind? Now, what do you do? What do you do when somebody threatens you and says, if I steal your money, will you complain about it? Well, I say, you're goddamn right. I'm going to complain about it. And so this is what I wrote back. I said, I said a couple things. We are now in an administrative conflict. That was the first thing I said, which was, I didn't want to say lawsuit, but I wanted to know that I work with lawyers and I am ready to zing this guy. I am ready to electrify him, pay 700 bucks or $2,000. Money doesn't even matter at this point. I will hire that attorney just to humiliate this person and teach him a lesson about respect. I'm going to do it. I will go get that attorney and I will ruin his life. Just over this. I was ready to do it. And I want him to know. So I said, never speak to me again. Airbnb will be in touch concerning your fraud. And that's all I did. Thankfully, I got $2,400 back. But this guy got $1,600 out of me for 10 minutes in this completely inappropriate house. Now, is it his fault? Well, he said, oh, you know... Somewhere in the big, big description of the property, it said noise might be a concern. Well, no, it should be in like bla blaring headline like, oh, this is the noisy fucking house that smells, sorry, that smells like a cat or like 20 cats all at once. Ah, uh, okay. Well, not into it. So that made me very, very, very upset. The fact that this guy wanted to steal my money, I had left my phone at the airport, I didn't have a phone and now I got to use Wi-Fi. So then I have to like use the Wi-Fi on my laptop on in his house in this horrible cat smell to like figure out what am I going to do next? So I decided, OK, I'm going to go to Burbank Marriott. And I saved all the receipts. I mean, I've got the proof that this all happened. So I went to Burbank Marriott. I've been there before and it's not bad. But ever since I started doing this Michael prophecies, I've lost the ability to veto background noise. So I go into Marriott, and now I'm hearing all the air going through all the ducts on the building. So it's like I'm lying there, and I'm just hearing, <sighs> it's crazy, crazy, rushing air noise. And again, it's cutting right through my earplugs. I can't get rid of it. I had asked for a quiet room. Wake up in the morning, I look out my window, and right down below me is this massive farm of all of the air conditioning units for all of the entire hotel. And it's right out my window, right below me. And it's this massive source of noise and it never stops. Oh my God. So I'm like, well, okay, I got to get a room change. So I go down to the desk and I say, well, could I get a room change? You know, because the room is right next to the massive noise source. And I asked you guys for a quiet room. Can you get me down at the end of the hall? 
you know, then I'll be farther away from it. Well, I go down to the end of the hall, I get my room change, and the lady was really nice. And then it turns out that the internet doesn't work, and it's still noisy. I'm still hearing air through the ducts, and, I'm, and I have no internet. And so I go down, and I'm trying to get another room change, and now I have a different cashier. And this lady is completely the opposite of the other one. The first lady was white, the second lady was Latina. I have no idea if that means anything or not, but this is just what happened. She said, we don't have any rooms. Oh, really? You don't have any rooms available? Oh, no, 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 we're all... I can offer you the lounge. <laughs> I can offer you the lounge so you can use the internet while you stay at our hotel. The lady who was at the same desk as you, one desk over, just told me I had all these choices. I picked the one at the end of the hall. Now you're saying there's no rooms available and you're offering me the lounge. I can't, like, stay at this hotel if all I'm going to do is work on the internet in a lounge because people recognize me. I'm naked in public. I can't just hang out in a lounge because everybody's going to go, are you David? And then they want to talk. Not that that's bad, but you can't. You can't get work done in a lounge, you know, not me. And she doesn't have any other rooms available. Okay, you know, that's fine. I'm good. So I checked out. I came back 10 minutes later. I'm like, I am freaking out of here. So now I don't have anywhere else to go, except that there was one more option, which was that one of the producers on our film had said, well, you can stay at my house. So that's what I ended up doing. That was where, I, that's how I ended up getting to Glendale. So again, remember, I don't have a phone. I don't have a phone. The only thing I have is GPS on the car that I'm using. And now I've got to be there at 1230. I've got to be at the venue at 1230. So I checked out of the hotel. I, I got all my stuff out. And somewhere along the way, I'm not even sure whether it was in one room or another room or in the guy's house or whatever, but I lost my car keys. I would love to know where the hell those car keys are. And I'll probably never find them. That became a big problem at the end because then I couldn't drive home and I actually had to drive a rental car to get home and I only went and got my car yesterday. I was on the road for three hours yesterday driving all the way down to Denver airport and all the way back just to have my own car. That's how bad this was. That's how bad I got screwed on this trip. Unbelievable. So then I hear, oh, well, well first of all, I had my phone, right? And the phone had clickable instructions on where to go. I've got a 12.30 p.m. call time, and I don't have my phone. And the only thing I remembered is that the producer, Jim, said it was at the Theosophical Library. Well, now, Theosophy, of course, ties in with Lovatsky and Alice Bailey and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes they got into Lucifer, and they wrote about Lucifer. So, ooh, it's Luciferian. Well, I go to the Theosophy place, I drove all the way there, and I only was able to go because I had a GPS in my car. So I type in Theosophy Library, I go to the Theosophy Library. Well, I, I buzz on the door, and they're like, well, who are you? Well, I'm here for the shoot. What shoot? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <sighs> so only right then did I find out, and bear in mind that it's now after noon. It's after 12. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to be early. This is awesome. I'm getting there early. Everybody's going to be happy. You know, we'll go into hair and makeup. We'll get this thing done. Oh, I'm at the wrong place. I'm like, well, okay, I don't have a phone. Can you guys please give me the, 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 the instructions for the right address? Because then I remembered, oh, no, it wasn't. There was the Theosophical Library, and then there was the Philosophical Research Society, which is actually run by, yes, Manly Palmer Hall, Nobody told me this. Nobody told me I was going to be working in Manly Palmer Hall's building. And they didn't know there was anything associated with it. It's like, well, do you guys realize that I just wrote about Manly Palmer Hall in Michael Prophecies? And that part of what I was saying is in the book, Secret Teachings of All Ages, which he released in 1928, 11 years after Lom contacted Aleister Crowley, this gray extraterrestrial who apparently taught him how to do black magic properly so that you can see lower astrals in the room. 11 years later, here's Secret Teachings of All Ages, and as I report in my book, Michael Prophecies, there's instructions in there on how to summon demons. And then at the end of the book, it's on page 100. First of all, it's on page 100, where they teach you what, what's going on, and that these creatures apparently ask you what you want once they appear. And they are here to fulfill your wishes. But then 
they say that you have to kill somebody four times a year in order to continue to receive whatever it is that they give you. Well, sounds pretty outrageous. And then at the end, the book says, we want you to join us. So it's like, okay, do you guys realize that by filming in, in this library, I got to answer a whole bunch of questions to the public because they're going to think we did this on purpose. I didn't even know where I was shooting. I thought I was shooting at the Theosophy Library. No, it's the other one. So thank God the guy was able to give me the address of 3910 North, whatever. He wrote it down on a piece of paper because uh, they had internet. I didn't. And I popped it into my GPS and it says it's going to take me 23 minutes to get there. Oh, my God. Or no, it might not have been 23 minutes this time. It was 23 minutes to get to the first place. Anyway, somehow, I, I, I didn't speed. I didn't do anything crazy, but I put it in the car, and I got there at 1223. And now they're decorating the place for Halloween. So they've got skeletons and chairs. It's already weird and dark and gothic as it is. They've got spider webs everywhere. They've got all this evil paraphernalia that they've decorated the place with, and they're doing more. So if you wanted to think there was something weird going on, it's made even more weird by the fact that there's like this very ornate wooden chair with all this carved work in it. And, and here's this weird skeleton in the chair. Woo! But the aesthetics were what we needed. We didn't have really any other libraries available like this <coughs> where you could actually rent space in the library and shoot next to book stacks. It just so happened that Manly Palmer Hall had this. Well, I remembered a line from the Law of One, which is no matter where you are, you are in the Creator. And like, for example, just because they did evil stuff in the White House, I don't think we need to demolish the White House after we find, well, yeah, you know, some bad stuff happened in the White House. Well, no, we don't need to rip it down. You don't need to destroy existing things just because something bad might have happened there. And I don't really know if anything ever happened in this place. Everybody seemed fine. I, I didn't get any sense that there was any active negativity going on there now. Uh, I mean, there was a couple things if I was paranoid, I could say, yeah, that might be, that might be. But no, no. I mean, honestly, this the book was written in 1928. That's like 100 years ago almost. So I don't really think anything was going on there. I could be wrong. But everybody was fine. I didn't have any problems. So I did the shoot in the midst of this horrible chaos, no phone, you know, very little food. And I did from, we taped from 12.30 to 5 o'clock, and we got the entire thing done. So when the movie comes out, which again is probably somewhere between three or four months from now, we're going to have special features, and they're going to try to keep almost the entire thing that I did for that whole four and a half hours in the show. Now, it's probably not going to add up to four and a half hours, but in the special features, you'll be able to watch almost the entire interview that I did. And... I was very, very focused on not saying any crutch words such as um or well or mm hmm or I mean or horrible things that really bother me like the thing is, is that or the fact of the matter is, is that it's like, well, you don't need to say that at all. But then why don't you say the fact of the matter is that? But everybody, a lot of Americans are, are infected with this. The fact of the matter is, is that. Why do you have to say is twice? It's like an institutionalized bad grammatical phrase. I was very, very aware of not stuttering, not saying any crutch words at all. And I was just very, very meditative and very dialed in and focused. We got the thing done and everybody was speechless. They were so amazed. Nobody even really knew what to say. This would also happen when I did Ancient Aliens. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that when people see somebody sit down for four and a half hours and just disgorge this incredible information without ever making a mistake, without ever needing to stop and retape at all, they're just dazzled. I mean, that's what it was at Gaia. If I have a half an hour show, you turn on the camera at the beginning, you turn it off after 30 minutes and you're done. You don't need to edit anything. Ancient aliens loved what I was doing too because they called it chop and drop. You chop at the beginning where David starts talking, you chop at the end, you drop it into the show and you're good. Whereas normally what they have to do is edit out all of these verbal idiosyncrasies that most people make while they're talking to create a performance that isn't actually in the original at all. I want my performance to be in the original. So that type of verbal 
dexterity where I'm trying to never make mistakes and I'm trying to speak with clean syntax is something I began practicing in the late 1990s and I call it conversation as meditation. Every time you're talking to somebody, you meditate and you create a meditative event. You create that place where you focus on your words and look at them as if they would be in a transcript. Are they going to transcribe into good text when you get it down there in writing? Well, this was just the beginning of all the crazy stuff that happened. So they're supposed to be having a party for me. The party actually happened last night. It was a Day of the Dead party. I brought my costume. I had this great outfit. But I still don't have a phone. So now on the first night after the show, all we did is, you know, go to a restaurant and, and hang out and have fun. And the next day, I, you know, I was very tired and I was extremely exhausted from all the stress and all the crazy stuff. So I basically slept most of the day in the house that I was staying in, and she wasn't there. She didn't have any food in the house, so I wasn't eating anything. Then we had another hangout that night, and we had a wonderful conversation once again. Everything was good, but we didn't have dinner. And so all I'd had was like sushi rolls and sashimi and really hardly anything. So by the third day, the malnutrition really, really started to break my body down. And I woke up and I could not get warm. I couldn't keep my feet warm. I couldn't keep my legs warm. I couldn't keep my arms warm. The temperature in Glendale had just plummeted. It got really, really cold. And I still don't have my phone yet. Uh, so at this point, it's like, okay, I really got to start taking care of this stuff. So I, I better find a phone right now because I can't even talk to my team. And the only thing I can do is use, you know, iChat on my uh, laptop, which at least I can text people. So I had some form of communication. So then I go to this mall <laughs> and it gets even worse because the AT&T store won't let you go in. He's got a desk blocking the front door. Like, wait a minute, are we back in COVID? What the hell is going on here? No, they won't let you into the AT&T store at this mall. So I was forced to wait in line with two people ahead of me just to be able to even enter the store to start talking about getting my phone. So I eventually end up sitting on the floor inside this hotel, well, well, not a hotel, a mall. And then right here is this big sign in front of me and it says, HIV, AIDS, no problem. Cancer, no problem. Diabetes, no problem. Overweight, no problem. Leukemia, no problem. You freaking dying, no problem. And then in fine letters, it says, we help pay your funeral costs. No one is denied for coverage. Well, first of all, if they say we help pay your funeral costs, that means they're not paying the whole thing. They might only give you $2,000. So here's this thing that looks a lot like, hey, you know, maybe there's a big uh, bunch of death going on right now and they're profiting off of this because the payments that you make per month to have your funeral insurance probably will exceed, if you live long enough, the $2,000 that they're going to do to put you in the cheapest coffin and throw you in the ground. So this is very morbid. I'm staring at this sign. I'm like, whoa. And I had lots of time to look at the sign because I was waiting a long time. Finally, finally, he lets me into the store after, for some magical reason, he let this, I guess, LGBT couple in. Because I see what looks like two women, but one of them is very skinny and has a baby in a Bjorn. And, and he, she is wearing a mask. I don't know why, but he let them into the store and they're just like hanging out and they're looking at all the phones and they won't leave. And then their baby starts going crazy. Their baby is having a tantrum and they still won't leave. And at some point, the guy's like, you know, nobody's wearing a mask at all. In fact, the whole time I was in LA, the only people I saw wearing masks looked like LGBT, believe it or not. That was pretty fascinating. And then when he took his mask off, I realized, oh, that's a guy because the jaw, okay, yeah, he's kind of got the right jaw, but he didn't look masculine whatsoever. He had no muscle mass. His body was incredibly thin and very spindly. And he looked like a gay woman. He really did. And his wife looked like a gay woman. So I'm like, well, isn't that interesting? So that's all going on. And then the guy says, oh, well, we don't have any phones that have more than 128 gigabytes of space. I'm like, well, dude, I, there's no way I can have a phone with 128. I already got more storage space than that just in my basic thing that I do. Oh, but that's all they got. And the only other thing I can do is have them mail it to me. So then I find out, oh, well, in order to get your phone, now that we're going to give it to you, it has to be in a vault 
that only unlocks after 15 minutes. So this is the trick they do to get you to go shopping, is that you cannot get your phone for 15 minutes. Meanwhile, they're still, you know, the lesbian couple is still, their baby is screaming away. I'm like, well, let's, you know, hopefully 15 minutes from now, they'll be gone. They weren't, they were still there, believe it or not. So I spent 15 minutes walking around. I'm like, well, should I get a massage? So thank God I had a meal. I ate sushi again, because I hadn't had any food. And I got this tickle when I, I was just walking around. I went into the bathroom. And I'm like, oh, I got to go back now. I go back just as the phone has come out of the vault. And then <laughs> I find out that, oh, well, the phone needs to download a software update before it's going to be usable. Okay. So then I look at the, at the software update and there's a taskbar along there. And it's like, oh, I got to wait for this whole thing. And he says, oh, well, if you leave the store, the Wi-Fi won't work. So now, okay, now I got to wait for this massive gigabyte size software update to download. So once again, I got to walk through the whole mall. And, and eventually I came back and eventually it was, it was just about done. Then it has to install itself. That took more time. They are still in there. The, the, the gay couple is still in there. The baby is still screaming. Finally, I got my phone. Finally, the phone is working. And I was able to, you know, type in the address of where I was, because I, at this point I memorized the house, the address of the house where I'm staying, but I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to get lost and I didn't have any other way to get there unless my phone works. So of course I, I popped the address in. Thankfully, unlike my car GPS, which will not allow me to put that address in, so therefore I have no way to get home, the, the, the phone would let me do this. So thank God. So finally I get all this stuff worked out. I go back outside, I'm walking through the parking lot, and I see what I think is my car. It looks exactly the same. It's the white SUV. It's parked in the same place that I thought I had parked it. No problem. I got my phone. I want to go home. I want to, you know, try to make this situation less crazy. Walk up to the car. I open up the door, and there's a lady in there, and I swear to God, she looked exactly like Fannie Willis. I mean, very, very similar, like disturbingly similar to Fannie Willis. Like, whoa, this has got to be something crazy. And she goes, Aah! like that was, I swear to God, I open up the door and she goes, Aah! I'm like, whoa, okay, you know, I got the wrong car. Sorry, it looks just like, it, I go, we got the same car, we got the same car. And I just like ran away because literally she goes, ah. I'm like, well, people are freaking crazy. People are freaking crazy in Los Angeles. Like, and I'm also thinking like, you know, if I was a criminal and I was like trying to hurt her, well, that type of reaction is only going to elicit more criminal behavior, <laughs> not less. So, <laughs> and I said to myself, something's going to be happening with Fanny. Something's going to be happening. And sure enough, there's been big, big developments just since that occurred. So that was really, really funny and also really scary because I felt really bad, but it was also like she just had such an over-the-top comic reaction, like, like some kind of demon or something. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, I, I, definitely not going to you know, do that again. I got, I got to really make sure I got the right car before I try to open it up. And there was no way to tell she was in there. I mean, it was tinted out. You couldn't have known there was anybody in the car. And then it was after that, when I was driving back, that I got out on the road and this guy behind me and I flipped him off. And then the next thing you know, it's like he wants to kill me. This is all in the same drive on the way home. Okay, that's when that happened, on the way home. Then the following morning, I had to park in front of somebody else's house because all the spaces in front of the house that I was staying at were already filled. And I go out the following morning and this guy has left a threatening letter on the, on the windshield of my car. And street parking is legal. There's nothing illegal about what I was doing. And he actually wrote, if you're not worried about my mobile home hitting your car, then I'm not worried either. Oh, that's a threat. He threatened me. He threatened that he's going to hit my car and he doesn't care what happens. It's got his name on it. I know his address. This is a threat. This is harassment. I could actually press charges against this guy and I could sue this guy. Just like I could have sued the guy that was threatening me on the road. Just like I could have sued the guy that stole 4000 tried to steal $4,000 from me. This was just crazy. So by that point, I was like, okay, I, I still, I got my phone that night. Let's go back a little bit. I got my phone 
and it just needs these massive, massive downloads. And then, of course, I maxed out on cloud storage space. I had too much space, uh, too much space that's not going to fit into 128 gigabytes. So I still can't get the phone to work. This is like the second or third night, the phone still isn't working. Finally, by the following morning, I was like, okay, the only way I'm going to get this phone to work is I got to start deleting all the videos off of it. Because I got to create enough space because it won't even, it won't even let me do dictation. You try to hit something, it just goes black. The phone is all screwed up. It's not working properly. I mean, thank God G Google Maps worked. But now it's like, okay, well, I got to go through and I got to delete a bunch of videos. So I start deleting videos. And of course, they're all videos with my ex-wife ex -wife when we were very in love. And everything was great. And so that creates all this sadness. And I'm getting all this kind of, you know, trauma from looking at old videos when I was happier. And... Um, and then the next thing you know, the guy calls me, my producer got first, the minute that my phone was like clear enough, he starts calling me because now it could finally work when I got the storage below 128 gigabytes. And I just lost it. I just started crying. I said, look, man, I'm just so cold. And I haven't been eating and I've got this massive sore throat and I can't stop coughing. And I'm just so exhausted and I'm so tired and everybody here is crazy and they're all evil and they're all wanting to like scream in your face and steal your money and rip you off and and get aggressive and cut you off on the road or kill you on the road. I got to get the hell out of here. I can't do this. So the next thing you know, it's like, okay, well, we can get you out on either 440 or 645. I was sad about that because I wanted to hang out. I wanted to have more time with friends. But I mean, by this point, I hadn't had any sleep. I hadn't had any food. My body is too cold. I'm just freaking out. And I had just now gotten my phone to work, but I'm like, well, I don't even care that the phone works now. I just got to get the hell out of here. Then we got this whole issue of, holy crap, I lost my car keys too. I don't think I have my car keys. What am I going to do when I get back? So we got the 635 flight and I had to go to LAX because I had originally landed at Burbank. So now I'm on my way to LAX. Got everything packed up. The drive was fine, but then I get there and it's like, oh my God, this is LAX. This is crazy. And it's all, you know, so much stress and everything, but I was able to get checked in, get on the flight. You know, everything ended up going fairly well on the way back. I, ha I was sitting next to this guy who was a music producer, and he's like rolling his eyes when I have to get out of the seat to go pee. And it's like, well, sorry, but you know, this is just in keeping with what's happening, which is that everybody is hostile, everybody is aggressive, everybody's pissed off. Everybody doesn't have enough time. They don't want to talk. They don't want to deal with anything. They're not dealing with the trauma of, oh, wow, there's all this stuff going on with Israel and Hamas. It's terrifying. It's like the eve of World War III. And I think, honestly, being in a major metropolitan area with all that psychic entanglement and everybody's so worried about the end of the world, it's like, man, um, I just want to make sure I'm still on the air. Okay, I am. <laughs> you never know. You want to make sure. This was just so intense. So, you know, other than the guy complaining about getting up, everything was fine. And I got back and then I got to the baggage carousel and I got my suitcase and I've been dreading this the whole time. Like, are the keys going to be in there? Because I've already been through my whole backpack and there's no freaking keys. After all the crap that happened, I get the thing off the carousel. I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. And oh my God. I mean, I went through every zipper, every pocket. I'm just, I don't even care. I'm like, Screw it, I'm a public figure, yeah, people could film me doing this, but whatever. I just dumped all the stuff out on the ground, right in baggage claim. No keys. Oh my God. What the hell do I do now? So I ended up renting another car. I rented a car in my hometown. I had to drive back here, and I only drove back when I was, you know, not completely exhausted to get my real car yesterday. And that took like three hours. So I don't know, when you get that much resistance, I was thinking about maybe I don't want to be here in the winter. It's so cold. It's, it's da, 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 da. But I'll tell you what, the only thing that matters right now is being someplace that's safe. And if it's safe for me to be in weather that's 15 degrees below zero, that's where I'm going to be. There's a lot of really interesting stuff coming out from the Alliance. If you look at uh, Shadow of Ezra, Ezra Cohen, uh, where they're talking about a November to remember. That was one of the posts they just came up with. So I think we are going to see some really big stuff happening. And I don't think we're going to be waiting a whole lot longer. There was just an announcement that during these upcoming 
during this upcoming trial that 45 is going to be putting out information about uh, various things that didn't go the way we thought they were going to go. I'm being very careful in how I speak. That could be the end right there uh, because that public address and as the classified information is revealed, that could very easily lead to other actions by demand, by public demand. And so I don't think they're even going to let those trials happen. And if that's in the early spring, then that means we're, we're in the hottest period right now. Again, I'll say this again. If you're trying to expect that this is going to happen all around the 2024 election in November, I don't think that's real. I think it's we might have multiple months prior to that point where there's a very, very different thing going on than where we are now. And we're going to be learning a whole lot. And, and I'm not even worried about it. Honestly, I'm not worried about the arrests. I'm not worried about justice being served. What I am worried about is the negative greeting that I get along the way, the negative attacks and the things that really try to, you know, knock me down emotionally, psychologically. And when you're in a place where everybody is this pissed off, it's, it's really not good. That was the thing I find out, found out is like, yeah, you know, you could try to dial in a pretty nice property. You could have some land around you so you're not like right up everybody else's back door and everybody's 10 feet away from you, which can happen a lot in LA if you're not careful. But even if I had some land, it's like, well, you're still surrounded by all these people who are basically having a meltdown. And so when I drove back to the airport yesterday, nobody's acting weird on the road. Nobody cut me off. Nobody was hostile. Nobody was angry. Nobody's yelling at you when you're walking around, when you go into a grocery store, when you go into the restaurant. For whatever reason, you know, Boulder has won the happiest place in America awards over and over again. And you can kind of see why. Because, you know, there's no anger, aggression, hostility going on here like there was out there. So I still don't know if I want to stay here the whole winter because it's, I mean, like today is 11 degrees outside. I have to wear ski pants to go outside and a base layer. So I don't really want to do this all winter, but I also don't really know where we're going next. Stavati, our, our aerospace company, it looks like we're getting some deals coming in. There's actually about four or five that are really amazing. But until they happen, we're still just on life support and it's very stressful and it's very intense, it's very dramatic. So my goal is not to keep repeating pain and, and, and difficult experience. My goal is to have fun and enjoy my life. And even though I got snow when I look out the window right now, I mean, it's just five inches of snow on my railings, I would much rather be here than in the summery weather of Los Angeles. And apparently, you know, San Francisco is even worse. But like, then I talked to my male guy and he told me that, yeah, his friends are saying that LA has gotten 10 times worse. I don't know if I'd say 10 times worse. I might say three times worse from my own observation. But yeah, it's, it's gotten really intense. So now is a great time for all of us to focus on our health, there's a tax against our health coming, and I gave you this whole comprehensive diet outline. And I've shared with you the, the full story about the horror that I went through doing this movie. So the only other thing I really have on the agenda is doing our global peace meditation. So I still have my voice, so let's, let's do that now. All right. So Mary Gabrielle says, I live in Oregon where everyone is in a delusional dream or high on mushrooms. Lulu Spears says, this sounds like a comedy skit. I mean, that's the funny thing, right? Is if it hurts you, it's funny. So I figured, you know what? If I got a woman like Fanny Willis who's screaming in my face like a demon, ah! I'm like, okay, well, that's funny. I mean, it was horrible. It didn't feel good when it happened, but <laughs> it is funny. <coughs> Ads show up depending on what's being talked about. Yeah, that probably happens. David, I think the idea is to be in the eye of the hurricane. Try to find out why you are manifesting what you are. Stay out of the blue states. I'm glad it's not just me. Keep up the good work, David. I'm sending my blessings. I enjoyed the L.A. story. It was very entertaining but exhausting for David. So no talking about levitation today, huh? Well, we could. I guess we could do a little bit of that. One of the things that was really cool was, you know, getting to do this film and having John Hutchison involved. The Hutchison effect, if you go and look that up, he was getting things to levitate. 
And the technology that we're going to be using to build hover cars is probably going to be a charge cluster technology. So John Hutchison was using that same system to get his levitation effects. And there's a lot that we could talk about, but as the movie gets closer to coming out, I'm going to be promoting it more. This isn't the only time. But we, I wanted to make a movie about levitating saints. And, and so we talked about, for example, Simon Magus. And this is a fascinating example from early Christian church history while uh, Apostle Paul and Peter were right there. So Simon Magus actually did levitate in front of a group full of people, and they got really freaked out. And while he was in the air, I guess 20 feet over the ground, he... Uh, he, he, he got woken up by, I believe it was Paul or Peter. And then after he woke up in the air while he's levitating, he no longer could levitate and he fell and he broke his leg. And the people were so freaked out about the fact that he had levitated that they stoned him to death. And no, we're not talking about cannabis. They threw stones at him and they killed him. And then there's a church of Francesca Romana, I believe, that was built right on that area where he was stoned to death, which might sound good, but in this case, it's not good. He got stoned to death. And so they built this church there because of levitation. We also talk about Yogananda's book. There's a whole chapter in there called The Levitating Saint, about a saint called Nagandranath Baduri. The point is that this stuff is seen all over the world, and it's not just Christianity, it's Hinduism, it's Buddhism. Uh, Sufism, you know, mystical Islam, all these different types of modalities of teaching can actually produce levitation. So in this movie, we're trying to get down into the causal mechanism, like how can universal law allow the human body to lift up into the air? How does this happen? And why is it related to your level of spirituality? Why is it that as people become more spiritual that they develop this ability? So we have uh, two of Dr. Greer's new insiders in this movie. We have D.C. Long and, Dr. and uh, Michael Herrera. So we are very happy to have them, and they have some very compelling stories to tell. It's, it's just an amazing thing. When, when you get people who are really professional, and they're going to spend months and months and months just to develop a two-hour piece of content, by the time that content comes out, it's just going to be incredible. And ancient aliens wouldn't let me talk about this. Why? Why are they so worried about human extraterrestrials? Why are they so worried about angels? Why don't they want you to know this? Well, if you go to L.A. right now, it, it's, it's the city of fallen angels. I'll tell you what, it's not the city of angels. It's the city of fallen angels. Whoa. I mean, like everywhere I went, it's just people are mad, they're crazy, they're angry, and they're aggressive. Let's have some more comments. Speaking of cannabis, I am loading up my bowl as we speak. Okay, good enough. <laughs> Some people like that. Infinite love and blessings, fellow multidimensional, infinite, eternal, radiant, divine, sovereign light beings, united we stand as a unique expressions of consciousness for peace and unity. Are you talking about Paramahansa Yogananda? Yes. Carnivore diet is the best way to lose weight. That's true. Greer is a reptilian. I don't think that's nice. <laughs> There are plenty of Catholic saints who levitated. I haven't heard of any of them being executed because of it. Yeah, go look up Simon Magus, and you'll see, sure enough, that's what happened. With extreme high voltage, high potential static dielectric fields, you can form an ether well and slower speed up magnetic and dielectric centrifugal centripetal forces towards a plane of inertia. Yeah, I, I kind of would agree with that. Um, watching David is like watching my version of the news, the truth. Thank you. I am planning to move from Air to Arizona from D.C. I hope things are better there. D.C. is just as bad as Cali. I can believe that. Innocence, clarity, love, unity, peaceful. Whoops. Did I just miss it? I guess I did. Sorry. Hot ginger and tea and honey, my friend. Get lots of rest. Come to Florida. Stay out of L.A. Yes, I agree. A Florida man did levitation on large stones to build a place near Sarasota. Many community agents know where it is. Yeah, that's the... Uh, Ed Leeds Scalman and the Coral Castle, which is very real. Dr. Greer looks like a tall gray. Ha, ha, ha. I think he's a little bit too heavy for that. You have to be very skinny to look like a gray. But I did make that joke before. Um, 
I levitated a few times about 28 years ago. My life had a major trauma due to a car accident. It affected my vibration. I was never able to levitate again. People can levitate because they are filled with light, which directly correlates with their level of spirituality. Are you going to print Michael Prophecies? Actually, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Like, you know what? The price I was selling it for up until very recently was less than it would cost to buy it in a book form. And I'm like, you know what? I got to get these in book form. So I think I am going to do that. They'll probably be, you know, $20, $25 a unit. Uh, I don't know if I'm even going to be able to get them out fast enough before all these things come true. But uh, anyway, are you just storing waste at your hangar? <laughs> Did you ever work in Seattle at a place for the mentally disabled? LA stands for Lost Angels. Uh, where's Chris? Well, I'm, I'm here by myself. Uh, so anyway, I think now's a good time for us to do the meditation. We got about 10 minutes left. So I definitely need to get that in because this is a technology that works. We have about 4,000 people watching right now. It says 3689. Right at this moment, we've had a total of 16,000 views already. And as people keep watching this, the, the meditative effect will spread. So we already have enough numbers that we can make a really, really big difference here. So why don't we get started on that right now? Okay. I got to give you guys some visually appealing camera changes here. <laughs> that one will look good. All right, here we go. <sighs> Let me get centered on this camera too. Hold on. And that way everything's perfect. Okay, I'd like you to put both feet flat on the floor. Take a nice deep breath. Breathe in. You may want to go through the nose and breathe out. And inhale again, nice and slow. Just let yourself breathe more and more. Filling your lungs with cleansing, healing oxygen. As you go deeper and deeper into the stillness and the peace of this moment. Feeling yourself light as a feather, like your body is floating. No concerns in your mind. No concerns about the past or the future, but just right in the now. You are here with me. We are together. We are creating a nucleus of power that cannot be surmounted or suppressed. A change is coming to this planet that will be a very positive healing benefit. And we are at the point now where all of these things are happening more and more. We're learning how to have greater degrees of compassion for ourselves. To learn how to stand up for ourselves. So that when people wish to do us harm, we have an attitude of forgiveness and healthy boundaries. As this is one of the key Law of One teachings. You forgive those who want to hurt you. But you also make very clear boundaries that you will not accept what it is that they are trying to do. You will not allow yourself to be wiped out, to be destroyed, to be lied to, or at least to continue to be lied to. Once you find out that's happening, you can withdraw. Going deeper into silence, breathing, Letting yourself relax more and more. Isn't it nice to just have this resonant peace always available to you? Continuing to feel yourself drifting farther and farther away. Like your awareness is becoming a single focal point. And you feel yourself drifting in an inky black void. The vastness of space as a singular point of light, a point of focus that is you 
It has your smile. It has your personality. It has your warmth. It has your love. It has your understanding. And it allows you to feel that everything is protected as this point of universal awareness, you are completely safe. Nothing can touch you because you are pure energy. You exist as a radiant point of consciousness and you cannot be threatened in this state. And as you ultimately know that this is your true state, that this is who you were born to be, who you are meant to be, and who you are becoming. You allow yourself to drift ever more deeply into that silence, finding yourself almost like you're deep under the ocean, and your awareness is so elegantly relaxed. The water causing you to feel a new sense of warmth, stillness, and renewal. And you're flowing ever so gently, breathing, letting your mind go deeper and deeper into stillness, deeper and deeper into peace, allowing this joy that is always around to just Rise, rise, rise. And you feel yourself, kinetic energy of levitation, tingling across your skin. The understanding that it is possible for some human beings to be able to achieve levitation. And we know that as they reach this state, as they approach this knowingness, the light vibration in their bodies creates lift, creates levity, a lighthearted sense of self, not taking yourself too seriously, not being consumed by the needs of the moment, overwhelmed by all the things going on. But going back to that point of concrescence that you have as that omniscient intelligence that only exists in its pure and complete form as light. You think about the things that happen to you the pains that you've been through, the agony that you have suffered, and you just let it go. <sighs> Use the power of your breath to exhale out the negativity, the judgment and condemnation of yourself, the stress that you have been feeling. Just exhale all the pain out. And as you breathe in, breathe in life. Breathe in now. Breathe in consciousness. Breathe in trust. Breathe in faithfulness, fidelity, brotherly and sisterly love, kindness. Let yourself feel what it's like to be self-realized to know that your goals have been met. There really is no striving here. There's nothing to strive for because totality already exists. Beingness already exists. Life already exists. Consciousness and infinite awareness has never left you. And you will never be separated from that awareness. All separation is an illusion wrought by the physical body and the mind. And the truth is far more exciting, far more vast. For we can take this point of peace, this point of concrescence that we are creating here today, 
And we can allow that peace to live out in the world, to spread into the world. We see this white light radiating into the world around where we are, wherever we live, spreading out throughout the countryside like a wall of radiant white energy until the entire planet is gleaming with this brilliant light that fundamentally rewrites the core genetic codes within our own DNA, giving us a chance now to see the future where all of us are able to levitate. And these natural laws of physics, little understood, work to our benefit. We send this healing light to the Middle East, to Israel, to the Palestinians, to Iran, to all neighboring countries. And we humbly request that the most peaceful outcome to this current situation be the one that occurs, minimizing casualties, minimizing hostilities, preventing any type of serious world war from occurring. We send our light to those who are making decisions, asking them to breathe, to calm down, to just be more fulfilled in their own lives without the desire for revenge, without the desire for vengeance. On either side, we envision a pathway to peace. We envision a diplomatic route in which things can be quickly wrapped up and in which all of these issues can become less stringent and less alarming than they are at this moment. And we know that this begins from the point of peace that we've created inside ourselves. So we breathe in again and we exhale out peace. We exhale into the world and we claim that mantle of righteousness for ourselves. For we are the light, the love, and the one infinite creator in our truest form. And nothing and no one can ever take that from us. And so it is. Amen. Now I ask you to breathe back in your body. Wiggle your fingers and toes. Let yourself come back to the body. Ah, Don't you feel good now? Isn't it nice to have a good meditation? I... I went for a big hypnotic induction there. I used the kind of really tired sounding voice so you'd really go far out. I hope that was good for you. I'm very happy about what we've achieved here. So I want to thank you for watching and we will see you next Sunday. I don't anticipate I'm going anywhere and I want to start doing more shows. So thank you for your support. And I really do need your help. So there's seven books of Michael Prophecies now available and those books are all at https colon slash slash the disclosure.com. We also have a 10 and a half hour course available right now. It's already deliverable. All 10, 11 episodes are done. It's called Sacred Science of Michael Prophecies. That's part of this course offering. And I'm going to have an upcoming new video course, which I'm going to start doing the slides for this week called The Spirit of Michael Prophecies, which is also included in this. And I'm going to have at least seven videos where I go through the seven books and hit all the highlights. So if you don't have time to read all this, you can watch video. So again, please don't hate on me. I had to go do this movie. I had to get this done. I know we have customers and they really want to see the next video series, The Spirit. I got to reread all the books and then I got to make slides. And so that's what I'm going to be doing this week. In fact, I might even start it today. Somebody said, thank you, David. I got your books, Love and Peace in the Middle East. I love your meditations. Awesome meditation stream. Thank you so much. Glad to see you back. I missed most of the show. I'll come back and watch it later. Yeah, I'm going to turn it off in just a minute here so that it'll now reset itself. But again, I wanted to keep it to two hours. So we will end it for now.